Hey, welcome back, everybody, to Backtracking, the podcast where we look back at the real-world inspirations behind classic episodes of Star Trek. I'm one of your hosts, Caliban, and I'm currently enjoying my mouthful of teeth. I'm joined on this episode by my co-host. <laughs> I'm Gooey Fame, and I'm a shower curtain hook salesman. <laughs> We've returned. Or earring salesman, I guess. Yes, they're dual purpose. We've returned to explore the stories behind your favorite Trek shows, and today we're talking about a DS9 episode and a John Hughes movie that have nothing whatsoever in common, but it's not going to stop us from trying to convince you that they do. It's the 1987 John Hughes classic, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, and the fifth season DS9 episode, The Ascent. I don't know. I think these are... I think both made these by Paramount. are the That's same the first. thing. Point one. They're both Paramount <laughs> Productions. Uh, I'll have to look at uh, Star Trek's use of the Oxford comma, or lack thereof, and maybe we can have a, a point of comparison <laughs> oh, there. Oh, okay, yeah. Because apparently this is Planes... And then also trains and automobiles. Planes, trains and automobiles. Okay. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, but I think as we uh, start talking about this, uh, you're going you're gonna to learn a few things about these two Ooh. things. And how I think they're uh, a, little more, a little more similar than people might uh, see at first, at first glance. Okay, yeah. I was on YouTube the other day and I was watching um, the channel Red Letter Media uh, does uh, like movie reviews. And they were talking about the movie Enemy Mine. Oh, and yeah. I had that pop up for me yesterday, too. I was yeah. like, wow, okay. Felt one like of the hosts. Yeah, one of the hosts is, I don't know. Yeah, it was a little weird. Uh, I'm, if they're fans, uh, hello. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm content. sure. I'm sure. It's possible because it is. it did come out of nowhere. And uh, one of the f- hosts is a, is a you know notorious Star Trek fan. And so they gave him like a little spot at the end of the video where he could you know make all the Star Trek comparisons. And he, uh, he picked up Arena. And he picked up um, uh, the enemy, the the Jordy LaForge episode from TNG. Okay, yeah. But he didn't make it to uh, Darmok, which is what we, of course, paired it with on our show. And then there is that I think it's called Dawn. There's that Enterprise episode that is just they're just doing Enemy Mine. Oh, oh, I I don't remember that one. Yeah, maybe uh, Trip, I would. Hmm. Trip and a Sulaban, I think, get uh, caught on a planet together in a survival situation, and they have to like you know learn to trust each other. I think I think I can understand like doing like the enemy or something at first because it is like that one is even more antagonistic you know what i mean where it was like right darmok it's like from the get-go you kind of get that it's not it's not about a fight between them yeah. but yeah. like but the just the alien design draw makes it so you know draws the comparison even closer and there are a lot of similarities still within but yeah one of the reasons that I think Darmok, uh, and I guess we've already made this point on on the episode that we <laughs> yeah. did, but one of the reasons that I think that it fits the best is because there really there is no B story. Like it is just about that. I'm sure um, I can't remember now, but I'm sure Wesley or somebody's getting up to something uh, in the enemy. Um, <laughs> yeah. Although although it is, I mean, it is self evident. I think that that does that's also a good fit. But yeah, I just think that Darmok and the idea of understanding not only understanding but like. Uh, assimilating some of the other um, person's culture as well, and that being the kind of key. Uh, so if Picard and uh, Paul Winfield, uh, you know, ended up in a in a mine shootout at the end with Brian James, then that, yeah, that would be one hundred percent a match. That would have been a good that twist. Weird, they have that a baby. weird left turn that that <laughs> that movie takes in the third act because you have to have a mine in it. Otherwise, why why is an enemy mine? Well, it's good to see, you know, Red Letter Media following in our footsteps, obviously. Yeah. And yeah. We they've paved the a, way for them. They've got a ways to go, but I think they're uh, <laughs> they're in good stead right now. Uh, let's talk about the news, as we sometimes do on the show. And the only news story that I really want to talk about is the fact that uh, Star Trek Prodigy, which is an animated show uh, that's on Nickelodeon and also on uh, Paramount+, Plus has uh, debuted recently, and it was announced that they will have 20 episodes in their first season. Um, It released, and nobody really knew how many there was going to be, and people Mm. figured 10's a nice round number, but it turns out there's going to be 20 episodes, and it it has also been greenlit already for a second season. Wow. And Mm -hmm. you have not gotten a chance to see uh, Prodigy yet? yet? No, no. Um, But it sounds like something I would be into, because... I think I I had told you a few times on your other show that I I enjoyed Lower Decks, uh, surprisingly, until we kind of started talking about it. And I'd be like, okay, maybe I didn't like it as much as I thought. But I have that power. 
Yeah, right. The thing I liked about it was that it w- because of the format and and everything, it kind of forced it to be a little bit more sim- simplistic in a lot of ways I liked. And I think my big gripe w- with it was like, sometimes it felt like this should just be a kid show, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. Because I felt like it's the edginess was not never really that edgy. <laughs> and yeah. so there's something about like, oh, they actually made a kid show. It, it sounds like it has all the like the structure and the elements that I would like from a show, you know, like kind of. Yeah. Yeah. And so it, and just the fact that it's now like for kids, it's like that actually sounds like a nice little thing to watch, I guess, you know. Yeah. I, I don't think the edginess works at all on Lower Decks, but I know that um, that's a big source of comedy for a lot of people who, who like it. But yeah, like I, I agree. Um, and also, you know. While I agree with that, I'd also point out that there's a lot of stuff in Prodigy that is, like, not for kids. Okay. I think they are <laughs> – it's the other side of the Lower Decks coin, the, the the sort of straddling that they're trying to do between two audiences. Because there's, like, a lot of, like, kind of dark things that happen in hmm. Prodigy. And I – the one saving grace I think that Prodigy has is that it's basically just, like um, – and people, don't fight me on this. It, it is. It's 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 – a job for hire, basically. I know Alex Kurtzman's name's on it. I know that it's coming out, you know, through Secret Hideout or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. But, like, it is written by these the Hageman brothers, who are the guys behind a lot of Nickelodeon cartoons and um, uh, Hotel Transylvania movies, and they're big animation guys. And so instead of, like, Alex Kurtzman getting his, like, cousin to, like, you know, show run <laughs> another spinoff of Star Trek, they just went to these guys who are already proven and write good material and do good shows and say, do one, but just, you know, have Star Trek arrows in it, and it'll be a Star Trek show. And so for that reason, it works. It, it mm-hmm. exists outside of the current, uh, you know, d- d- Paramount Plus, uh, Discovery, um, uh, Picard kind of uh, sphere, which, you know... I respect, but I, I have issues with that I've talked about, you know, on this program. And so it's like it's like just it's like somebody else doing like a Star Trek show. And that's what we need more in Paramount, I think, is to reach out to talented, established uh, filmmakers, uh, TV makers, you know, and say, hey, do a thing, do your thing. Just do it in Star Trek. We were ha- we had that with Brian Fuller, but it's not all Star Trek's fault. Brian Fuller is hard to work with, apparently, because he's oh. quit, he quit like three shows in a row. But yeah. uh that was the idea, and instead it became like the guy who directed The Mummy, you know, is kind of in charge of Star Trek. Yeah, what? How did that happen? Uh. <laughs> I don't know, I, because he's a friend of J.J. Abrams, I guess, and wrote some of his movies, but... Yeah. So anyway, um, <laughs> let's, you know, cancel the negativity and yeah. get back to say that, uh, yeah, yeah, it is a really good show, um, and I've really enjoyed it so far. And 20 episodes, okay. They're like All right, man. 20 minutes long, right? Yeah, they're half an hour. Yeah. Okay. So okay. Well, that's good. Uh, that again gets back to like I would like to see. I guess it's it's just a different format. Like that's probably more common with cartoon shows, right? That they kind of have some longer. But there are runs. a lot of episodes. Yeah. 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 But I was sort of thinking like I don't know. It just sounds that sounds more my speed. Like I I want the more episodes because then you can you know, flesh out a lot of the characters and had given them their own little stories. Cause that's kind of an issue. We, you know, kind of gripe on every once in a while is you don't really get to learn about some of these characters that are like, you know, fourth down the chain of command or whatever. Yeah. They say, what is it like? No plan for an army like survives first contact with the enemy and like no, no character in my opinion, should survive like the first season of a show like you come up with a bible you say that um Riker well, he's pretty suave but he worries that he's not uh, ready to be a leader or whatever if you're still playing those beats in like season 2 or season 3 you're not growing these characters at all you got to go oh, somewhere yeah, with yeah. them and like one of my um sort of criticisms of um lower decks is that i don't know what they're waiting for like i know that they want to have in a cartoon fashion um, the, the sort of reset, like we come for these wacky characters, we come, you know, to laugh at their antics. Um, but like, they're also trying to grow it a little bit. Cause like they're trying to do that, straddle that line of it's a drama, it's a comedy. And they played out like, I like the character Tendy and Rutherford and I like their connection, but they played like the same 
were friends who are maybe more beat for 10 episodes in the second yeah. season. And they did it in the first season, too. And so I just wonder, like, come on, guys. Like, where are you going to go with this? You got to take this somewhere. And already in Prodigy, we've seen that each one of these characters has, you know, a secret shame or whatever. It has something that is their problem. And, you know hopefully we'll get to see them develop. Although I'd imagine they're probably thinking about how they can slow that development down now that they have, <laughs> you know, 20 episodes to fill. And then who knows how many in the second season. Yeah. But anyway, short review, uh, you know, after three episodes, pretty good. Pretty good. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm definitely going to get on that. I, I was like, the thing was, I was just like, I got to finish lower decks and I was kind of dragging my feet on that. Cause yeah. I was like, not really, like I said, I enjoyed it, but I wasn't like loving it. So I wasn't like, you know, if I, if I had a choice between that or playing uh, Final Fantasy IX that I'm playing right now, <laughs> oh, I was yeah. like, let's play Final <laughs> Fantasy IX. I can yeah. do both at the same time, actually. There's a lot of just downtime <laughs> in the game. I skipped nine, and it was because, like, I had played seven and I played eight and invested a lot into those. And then nine was sort of like a different direction. Yeah. And I was burned out. And also after two games, because eight in a lot of ways copied the sort of aesthetic of seven, um, I just did, wasn't down for like the more cartoony characters, even though that's the, the roots of Final Fantasy. That's kind of where I'm sort of at, but I, I where I was like, I just played seven and I was like, this is one of the greatest games ever made. And I was yeah. like, all right, I'm 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 in on Final Fantasy now and I'm playing this and I'm like, this is just not as cool. Like, it's just not cool <laughs> in the way seven is cool, but the, the system and the mechanics are all sweet. Yeah. So I'm like, yeah, that, yeah. I got to keep going. <laughs> I got to keep equipping the armor and choosing right my spells. I got a big head. I need a helmet for my big head. Oh, the yeah. head. So- yeah. Come on. <laughs> so anyway, I, I do plan to track back and, and, uh, and try to do final fantasy. Nine. Someday I gotta <laughs> it's get on through final fantasy. Yeah. Yeah. I gotta, I gotta get through 15 first. Oh yeah, I don't know. Maybe I might like that one because I like I like that remake seven remake like combat and it seems kind of similar. Yeah, yeah. That it's a lot of that, and then it's just riding around with your boys. <laughs> I do um, like that. <laughs> but I gave myself a huge roadblock uh, to that goal in picking up The Witcher three. Oh, okay. Are you liking Which I'm that? Now completely immersed in. Yes. Um, we need to talk about our subject for today, so I'm not going to go on forever. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, it's, it's a video game podcast now. But like, long story short, with The Witcher, not impressed with The Witcher um, in oh. between the kind of weird, um, uh, just kind of chauvinistic uh, world. I get that world can be dark and, and, and crap sack, but like you don't have to seem like the, you know, the game doesn't have to relish in like the misogyny, <laughs> you know, and the, uh, the adult content. And so played the first game, um, got, there was some kind of save bug that like wiped out my saves in the second act. So I was like, oh, screw this. I'm not doing this. And then skipped the second one because of aforementioned issues. Third one came out a long time ago and people will not shut up about how it's the best game ever. And so I, it finally got down to like 10 bucks, you know, on a, on a sale, uh, good old games or whatever. And so I picked it up and. God damn it! It's it's pretty good. It's good. It's pretty. Yeah, it's pretty I've, good. I've tried it actually, but I don't have RPG brain. Oh, but if you don't like RPG stuff, well, yeah, it's not gonna. I, it's not gonna work. I think Final Fantasy VII cracked the code on my brain. Cause yeah, that's not, a pretty deep uh, RPG. Now I'm compa- like that's why I'm playing nine. I'm like, ooh, I love RPGs now. Yeah, so yeah. If you can, I'll go back. If you, if you like linking materia, then then you're oh my definitely god, the RPG I love gene. it. I love yeah. linking materia. Yeah. <laughs> so just to wrap it up real fast, like I, the writing is is really great, and a lot of the sort of misogynistic things that I had mentioned before have been either removed or kind of contextualized in the way that I was talking about. Um, I like the fact that it is a morally gray world, and that plays into yeah. a lot of the missions um, because there's often no good choice to resolve something. And, uh, and like, Geralt's a badass, obviously. Um, so, yeah, uh, just kind of eating eating uh, eating my lunch. What's the expression? Kind of eating crow a little <laughs> bit. Uh, don't know if I'll go for Witcher 4 if there's a Witcher 4, but I am uh, liking the crunchy RPG stuff. Um, yeah, you, you're making me think about it again. I'm like, all right, I, I think I can get on board. I got to play it. I will say, though, that as I play it, and you're kind of running around and you're following the quest markers and you're solving all the... Uh, the quests and stuff and killing monsters. I don't know if it's like ennui or if it's just that I've played video games for almost like 40 years. 
But I'm like, is this it? <laughs> you know, like, is just the next game that everybody touts as the game of the year or the best game of all time just going to be me looking at the back of somebody's head, but it just with like more detail in their in their head? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I feel like games have stuck on this open world thing. And you see, you know, yeah. see the audience's response to something like Far Cry 6. Like, people aren't even like criticizing the story or the graphics or whatever. They're just sick of like open world games. And I'm wondering, like, what's the next paradigm can it be vr kind of sputtered out and we've found nothing to really replace it and so all games you can expect will be a gta-esque clone right where you just run around that's yeah. that's what i've been exp- i've been going back and playing playstation games that i kind of missed and it's like on that era where it was like games can be so much more than you ever thought it could be and it's like pe- sure. people think of like those games as dated but i go yeah. back and play them and i see like this great like cross section of gaming and like think thinking about like the exciting new future you know what i mean i still feel that when i play those instead of you know like you could play a game that's far more technologically advanced like every assassin's creed game but it's no way as exciting as playing like symphony of the night or final fantasy 7 or yeah, metal gear yeah. solid or something you know yeah or even just something like portal which you know takes invents an entirely new gameplay right. mechanic oh, yeah. and then become it becomes the way that they tell the story the way that you progress in the game the way you solve puzzles and uh, it's a it's a totally different dopamine hit than just crossing this marker off the map because you killed the goblin or, or whatever <laughs> right check mark the game yeah that's pretty much what the witcher is <laughs> for me so far uh but i am liking it though uh okay video game podcast ends so trick podcast restarts Here yes we go. let's talk about our featured subject for this week's episode for most people the holidays are a time for celebrating the past year reuniting with family and loved ones and doing your best to avoid that damn mariah carey song it's easy to be <laughs> preoccupied during the holiday season with buying presents and traveling to meet family and getting the turkey just right but not everyone is blessed to have the kind of holiday holiday bounty that would make for a good Norman Rockwell painting. And the greatest gift some people need during the holiday season isn't a Casio watch, but companionship and validation from their fellow man. That sobering premise is the basis for the improbably hilarious 1987 film Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. During holiday travel, some people get delirious. Some get delayed. And some get <laughs> Del Griffin. American Light and Fixture, Director of Sales, Shower Curtain Ring Division. Neil Page got all three. I was on my way home to spend a nice holiday with my family. Instead, I'm in a motel bed with a stranger. So instead of Thanksgiving with his family, he's spending three days with the turkey. People! Two happy clams just whistling down the road. Flintstones, meet the Flintstones, they're the modern family. Paramount Pictures presents Wilma! Steve Martin. You ever been to Hawaii? Yeah. You see God Ho while you were there? See the second show, that's the best one. Is that right? Yeah. John Candy. Why are you holding my hand? Where's your other hand? Between two pillows. Those aren't pillows. In a new film by John Hughes. Plane, train, and automobiles. See that Bears game last week? Yeah, hell of a game, hell of a game. I, th- I think that Mariah Carey song bangs pretty hard. <laughs> Just, do I have to hear it 50 times? Yeah, not as not as much as some of the music in this movie. <laughs> some of the grooving <laughs> tunes in this movie. Yes. Yeah, the music is is of now this would all just be needle drops, right? But like this is still at a time when we need a, a, a something kind of light and funny here. You know, we need something more serious here. We need a, a, a cover of uh, every time you go away mm-hmm. here. Um, and of course, it's by Ira Newborn, who worked on almost all of John Hughes's movies. Um, they work together. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, it definitely colors what's going on. It makes it a lot of fun. But, yeah, it's uh, the, the synth, synthy sounds of the 80s are it's, present in this film. It's so charming, though. It's like, yeah, it is. It, it is like really of its time, but like in a good way. It's like a, a great time capsule almost. Yeah, this um, I got to say, like this ranks high. You know, this is high on my list. This might be uh, near the top of my favorite movies uh, ever and it's one that I've seen a million times and it's one that is I, it just makes me laugh 
you know, just openly, uh, you know, and yeah. all the gags. I even know they're coming, like things that, you know, that only work because you're surprised by it. I, there's just, I still laugh at it. And it's also like, you, you're you're killing me with these like touching, poignant movies because it's also an emotional <laughs> movie. Uh, and it comes not out of nowhere, but you don't know that they're building like this, this edifice of like, of human empathy and, and kind of sorrow. And then it, they hit you in, in that last five minutes of the movie. And it's like, Oh my God, I got to call my dad. I, I actually do like that. I, like it gets very, it gets very sentimental in a way, I guess that I sort of think of John Hughes movies, I guess. Um, yeah. But it's like, it, yeah, it's like the rest of the mo- movie has a very more like, um, I don't know, I, uh, cynical tone almost, I guess. Yeah, it does. And that I think that is characteristic of uh, John Hughes and also characteristic of 80s comedies. Um, what people don't think about, or at least I guess I didn't think about this um, the first 300 times I saw this film, is that in a lot of ways it's, um, it's a class drama. Yeah, because, yeah. Uh, Steve Martin, who, when he is not a wild and crazy guy or a jerk or whatever, plays an unending string of of executives you know he's either in advertising or he is um, a sales executive or he is a lawyer or something like that uh in almost he was like he's the straight man in like all his films um until unless he is also the (laughs) the the cut-up guy and so he is a guy who clearly is has privilege privilege they don't hit it over they don't hit us over the head with it but it's clear that he, you know, he's commuting from New York to Chicago. He's got a nice house in, I don't know, Kensington or something like that. And yeah, northern and, suburb. Yeah, Highland Park, something like that. Yeah, and uh, and so you know that he's used to this kind of life, and he's very particular about what he eats. In a modern movie, there would just be some kind of speech. You know, we would open with like he would just talk about how he's had pretty good 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 year pretty good year and uh i'm gonna get in my jag oh the jag's in the shop or something but these little things tell us that he is a person who is not only privileged but is you know circumspect and keeps to himself and then he gets hooked up with dell which for him is a nightmare but this is dell's world and the entire movie is populated with uh, not trying to be insulting, but uh, hicks and hayseeds, you know, and, uh, yeah. and weirdos. And uh, I just like like Dobby's, is it Dobby? Doobie, Doobie's cab when they take the cab to the to the first hotel they go <laughs> yeah, to. Like rocks. this is just a guy that, that Dell knows. Like this is, these are the highways and byways of America. And Dell is, you know, he's the, the great white oh, whale. He's, of, he's proud of, of his town. <laughs> yeah, he's proud of all the towns. Yeah. And so that it's, you know, it's a story about Steve Martin eventually sort of opening up and then Dell also opening up emotionally, but it's also him just having to deal with all these people that he would never, never, ever interact with in his first class seat on his, you know, New York to Chicago. Yeah, it's flight. it's funny how so many of so many of like the positions he gets put in is because like he doesn't even want to like suffer like a quiet indignity of like having to stay at the airport for too long you know he sees the guy sleeping <laughs> yes. on the floor it's like yeah who had like you haven't just like had to like sleep at an airport for a little bit you know like it sucks yeah. but like i don't know <laughs> it's not it's yeah. not the end no, of the world he hasn't <laughs> no he's, yeah. he's had uh convenience and, you know and privilege um that's i'm glad you brought up that bit because uh that is a great example of something that Hughes does uh, in his other films, but he he does to great effect in this movie, and that is these these inserts, you know, these little things like little jokes, um, little things that you put in. Nowadays, we would just have Melissa McCarthy and her scene partner just riff for twenty minutes, and then we just you know, put something together. Uh, but like all yeah. these things are so Sorry. planned, you know, like the guy sleeping next to the trash can in the airport, and we don't have, Dell doesn't have to say anything, or uh, Nick doesn't have to say anything. We're like he knows I do not want to be here overnight yes or they go to the hotel and he's already had kind of a rough patch with dell and then he's taking a shower and he just looks up and we see the shower rings and he's like okay yep that's (laughs) that's what's going on right now yeah he the way that he tells the story and also just um and makes the jokes with those inserts is just great it does it like it does walk um an interesting line where like steve martin is he is this guy you know that you're like you're you like kind of don't feel sorry for him but then like obviously he's in some of these situations where it's like 
oh my god like i like when he has to get out of the shower and it's disgusting <laughs> you know yeah, you yeah. do actually like relate <laughs> to some of that stuff you know like yeah like oh i just like my skin crawled you know it, i feel like it walks that line really well of like you kind of feel bad for him sometimes but you know, like when he gets abandoned at the at the parking lot for the rental car. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes. It's just like this weird, like, balancing act that the movie plays. And it does the same thing with John Candy's character, too, obviously. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. I, I was impressed with how they pull that off. I, wonder, I was not class conscious in the 80s when I first saw this. So I don't know if... Um, I think that an 80s audience would immediately identify with Steve Martin. Um, nowadays we would go, oh, this guy gets to fly first class and he's got this great, you know, house and beautiful wife and kids and he's got $721 in his, in his wallet or whatever. Like, am I supposed to relate to this guy? But I think an eighties audience would immediately. Yeah. And so I think they put things in specifically. So, you know, that Neil is an unhappy guy and he is not, you know, he is not a personable person. Um, the, uh, the 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 taxi cab race with Kevin Bacon at so <laughs> the beginning good. of the movie yeah. kind of sets that up for us, and then the movie breaks down into sort of three acts, you know, because you think about it as this long road movie where they go through this whole um, this journey out of problems, and they're in the they share a hotel bed in the first like twenty five minutes of the movie, but we get to see these little things build up with. Um, with with Neil and he goes off on him and gives him the you know the chatty Cathy ah, 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 speech, which seems like something that would be a lot later in the film or at some sort of crisis mm. or turning point. But that just like that makes a, that makes him a prick and makes us be on Dell's side immediately. So then throughout the rest of the movie, as Dell is doing all this crazy stuff, we're still kind of with him because we see the human being uh, that Neil refuses to see. Yeah. And so the first act is you know we have to sort of make Neil a prick and sort of push them apart. The second act is all the trouble that they have. And the third act, you know, we, we realize that, um, that, that, you know, Dell's a good guy, but he's got a problem and they sort of get together. It gives, it has this thread the whole time of like, you can feel him wanting to get away from him, but he can't. And it, it, I think it makes it better when it's more explicit. And I also think it contributes the pacing, like and the tone work really well where like, that's that's kind of why it, I feel like it does have more like the cynical feel until it dives into the sentimental where I feel like if this was uh, a 90s late 90s like Adam Sandler movie if it was like a big daddy <laughs> type movie huh. or whatever yeah. Apatow like you would have that speech you know at, at the second act and then there's like this whole portion where we just like feel sorry for ourselves and it's right over overly sentimental and it's like is this a comedy anymore you know yeah right um, yeah yeah uh, yeah the, the that that turn that sandler movies always take in like the late second act where it's like oh this is you think i'm gonna cry or something yeah. like that this is really serious, oh yeah that was 50 first dates where it's yeah and it, it runs the risk of being so manufactured and yeah this yeah and this doesn't need to do that because it's sort of constantly building up uh, it's it's tension in that regard, and it keeps letting the the steam out. Uh, sometimes literally, in the case of the train, because <laughs> yeah. they keep getting to points where they they naturally could part. And instead of um, we, you know, we get that one big speech early in the movie out of uh, a Steve Martin about him. You know, I was whatever happens to me, I'll say I was I was with Del Griffith, and they'll know what I'm talking about. And then after that, they keep kind of splitting up and he's just he's nice about it. He doesn't like yell and say, hey, you know, I hope I never fucking see you again or anything like that. He's just like, no, I bought your train ticket. Don't worry about it. OK. Yep. Goodbye. Yep, so, OK. But then he's so relieved, you know. Good, and then, Yeah. And then he's relieved. And you then, of t- course, they're driven right back together again. <laughs> you could tell Usually when because he's almost hit by a car. He almost gets hit by a car a like lot. four times yeah. in this movie. Yeah. <laughs> you could tell when he's talking to the girl on the train that he's like so relieved to talk to someone normal. In his yeah, mind. but also yeah. he's, he's he's talking to somebody. I mean, he might have just been saying to Dell because he had him pegged as somebody who's going to bother him that he's not a conversationalist. But throughout the course of the movie, I think you see him sort of loosen up, you know, and he just makes small talk with the with the girl on the train. You know, later on when they finally get that other hotel room, uh, he's like, "Yeah, give me the give me the Doritos, you know, give me the tequila." And he's sort of loosening True. up uh, over the course of the film. True. Okay. Yeah, I I totally can see that. I feel like in the in the way they they set things up and like the way the structure and the pacing goes, it it has like it it's like the comedy 
pacing of like a good like action movie too where like you just you get the premise like they start the movie right away and you know the setup and you know the premise and <laughs> yes. and you understand like how you you everyone knows when thanksgiving is and like um for me too like knowing the destination and like how far they are like helps too so like you understand yeah. like the stakes and everything in a similar way like a good action movie like always sets up like like every scene almost you understand like the stakes of every move and that's how i feel on this like when something starts to go wrong like there's they actually build like you said tension and there's also like suspense and all that stuff you know you you know when it's like okay i'm gonna put my wallet in the glove compartment and then he flicks the cigarette and you can just feel all the movement and everything and that's like kind of how the whole movie is where like it's just kind of propelling forward you know and then with occasional stoppage but yeah. yeah it's the the it's the the movie is like tied up like a like a christmas ham in terms of like the connections uh that you mentioned like even even at the end when he's he's taking the l back home and he's and he he looks at his watch and he realizes of course i gave my watch to the guy (laughs) in the hotel and then he immediately starts to begin to think about all his adventures with dell yeah and it it is like you said because like it's it's written and planned and like the jokes are written and they are just like let's let's goof around you know every scene (laughs) yeah and the funny thing is, is that they had to rewrite huge parts of this. Like, there are things that they had planned to do. Uh, Hughes originally wrote, like, a giant script, um, uh. hoping to get a lot in. But this is a tight, you know, 92 minutes, and it shouldn't be a second longer. Yeah, um, no. But he had plenty of other stuff. And so some things got dropped. Some things got sort of changed around. And other things got totally recontextualized. And here's some examples. When Michael McKean, you know, stops them in their burned out car, they ADR'd a line about how they were. um, I I can't remember exactly where they were, but they were supposed to end up driving in the wrong direction. So they actually ended up driving west. And then he was supposed to be a cop in, like, Wyoming or something like that. No, Because there was a no. whole other, like, 45 minutes in the movie that they were going to do. And they cut that out. And then there's other jokes that got better because of the cuts. So when Steve Martin gets takes a shower, gets out of the shower in the first hotel, and he gets in bed, and he's like, you know, I'm really sorry. I didn't know those beer cans were going to explode. <laughs> yeah. They filmed all that. Like, they, of course, they did all that. But it just becomes more comedy wallpaper. We don't have to see, like, every single thing that happens. The guy that robs them was actually uh, a pizza boy who, because uh, they talk about how he had some pizza or whatever, that just becomes a line in the cafe the next day. But there's a whole scene where he orders the pizza and he stiffs him on the tip. So the guy decides to come back and rob them later. Oh, okay. But it would have been so much worse for all that. Like, having all these things that suggest action but but still focusing on our two leads and the funny things that they do um, makes this just so much more clean. Uh, there's a whole subplot that was dropped where Neil's wife thinks that he's cheating on her. Uh-huh, and so every yeah. time he calls her and tells her that he's not going to be there, it's, you know, she thinks that he's out somewhere. And so we keep cutting back to her during the movie and she's, you know, of course she's beautiful and she looks sort of pained. And we just kind of think of her as like, <laughs> you know, it is the, funny, the, like the Penelope that, uh, that, you know, Odysseus is trying to return to. You just to. keep cutting to her, like laying in bed, watching TV, yeah. looking but sad. The, <laughs> but the intention of those scenes is that like, she is thinking like, I, what's he do? What's he doing right now? And like the the TV, like uh, the some of the dialogue of the TV is like a couple having a fight. Like that's what's supposed to be happening there. But ultimately, she's just the prize to to sort of get back to it. Yeah, and I thought that was really funny. Her her and they're like those those little tykes, <laughs> all those little kids with their little haircuts. Yeah, jo- young Joey Lawrence. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> that was him, wasn't it? When he's on the train and he's kind of reminiscing and he's seeing himself at like a Thanksgiving dinner, like we just assume that it's his imagination or it's a Thanksgiving dinner of your, of years past, but they shot that scene and Dell is at the table. Like they did that whole thing, but they realized, oh. no, no, the per the end is he gets home and, you know, he says, hello, Mr. Griffith. Hello, Mrs. Page. And that's, that's your end right there. We don't need this whole scene. So they just cut all that. Yeah, no, it's, it's tighter because of it. I don't think, yeah, I don't think it needs to be longer for sure. Yeah, for, for sure. I mean, sometimes, you know, that's that's what the breaking of the eggs is to make the omelet. Sometimes you got to kill your darlings and, and, and get rid of stuff that's uh, that's weighing it's, you down. Yeah, especially for a comedy like this, you know, 
It's I, I feel yeah, like com- a good comedy. All movies are too long now, and and yeah. comedies especially. Why comedies are so long now? Yeah, well, yeah, I I think of that. Like I keep thinking of like Judd Apatow movies or like Adam Sandler movies, or it's like like two and a half hour trudges, and I don't know. We yeah. we it's got to be very serious, and I don't know that that's good sometimes, but um, I don't know. I guess I just think of this I, in my mind. It's like a partner with like a really good action movie in that like it not always but like i feel like it should its main purpose to serve is like to be whether it's an action to be like exciting or a comedy to be like funny (laughs) but still have still have a good story and everything you know good characters but like i feel like they i don't know it get they get in their way of themselves sometimes you know yeah yeah, just you know, sh- shorter, shorter's better. Uh, hit fast, fade away. You know, Preston Sturges would be rolling in his yeah. grave right now. How long comedies are? Yeah, if people are like sitting here, I sound a million years old, but I'm not wrong. Yeah, th- I I feel like that's just like what we always sound like now. <laughs> I mean, it's, like, <laughs> it's just that two Star Trek s- fans complain about old movies, singing the praises of Time Cop. You know, <laughs> going <laughs> yeah. oh, they don't make them like they used to. Yeah, you know that enemy mine. That's something else. <laughs> uh, yeah, there is a character to this. You know how like they say like, oh, you, New York is a, is a character in this film. You know, for <laughs> movies that are set in New York. Yeah, that that's kind of they they spread that across the entire nation. So they run into this cavalcade of like you know weirdos and character actors, and that is um, that's so of this time. Um, you don't. I don't feel like a. You don't see that in movies so much anymore. And b. If you tried, if you made this today, and they do want to make one with Will Smith and Kevin Hart, and my question was hmm. par- parenthetical inside a parenthetical, who's the Dell? <laughs> you know what I mean, like who's the John hmm. Candy character? Uh, you would say Kevin Hart because he's wackier than Will Smith, but Kevin Hart is usually the guy who is like. Everybody calm down. He's the guy in his movies that crazy things are happening to him. That's right? like, yeah, I feel like they had that sort of dynamic. He had it with uh, The Rock in that Central Intelligence movie. Oh, my God. Yes. Where, like, The A Rock movie which, was Dell. <laughs> did that inspire any Star Trek? Because I feel like we've mentioned Central Intelligence at least once. <laughs> I don't know. It's not show. a good movie, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know why I keep thinking of it. But it is actually, it's kind of funny sometimes, so. Kumail with the Um, snake. Anyway. (laughs) So maybe that'll succeed. But the problem is, is that you will create a a world, I think, that I'm not sure exists anymore. You know, the idea of uh, Doobie's Cab and, you know, the weird hotels, um, just the the kind of freaky people. Like, it's just going to be a a series of days ins, won't it? And all days ins look the same. They're all, like, corporatized. Uh, They're all... Um, have a cable in the room and and the the kind of America that could this do is showing a commentary us. on that maybe I guess <laughs> just point out like we're sorry this movie's boring but uh, <laughs> America's kind of boring. Well, now. I was also thinking like uh, you know I'm just gonna I'm gonna sound like you know the movie boomer here again, but like you know <laughs> they go, go they go to the one uh, hotel the first one I think and it's got the old guy and he's such a yeah. like distinct looking dude. I don't know if he's in other stuff that I would know, but you know what I mean? He has like a very genuine look and feel like he's like a cool character actor, but that role now would be played by, you know, like Melissa McCarthy or something like, Oh, like, Oh, she's here in the movie. You know, it's, I don't know. It would just wouldn't be like, we don't have anybody. We don't have anybody like that who looks like weird and old like that anymore. Everyone's like, it's all like, various degrees of Ryan Reynolds or something, you know? Yeah. Or the, um, I can't remember this actor's name, but he is a, uh, a character actor. The, the old guy who's sleeping on, uh, Neil's shoulder, like on the plane. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. He's, you know, it's like, Oh, it's, we've got to have that old guy. And I'm sure there's probably a scene where they talk about something and that they probably cut from the movie. Uh, remember Richard Hurd, Richard Hurd character yeah. actor, uh, plays Tom Paris. He's in this. He's he's uh, uh, Neil's father-in-law. <laughs> he's in the oh. movie for like two seconds at the end of the movie, and it's like <laughs> apparently there must have been some more scenes with him. Like, why would you cast? Why would you cast him and then do nothing with him? Yeah, I, mean, I feel like there's just like 
I mean, like Kevin. I mean, Kevin Bacon was already in Footloose, right? He was already. Oh yeah, big. Kevin Bacon was a thing already. Yeah, like he doesn't even really get like a special credit or anything. It's like kind of shocking when he's just like there and has no lines. Like, yeah, it's pretty he's just cool. Man, man running for taxi. It's pre- you know, I get it. It's pretty flatliners, which <laughs> was probably is <laughs> bi- that was his big movie, but. Yeah, that's true. That's yeah. <laughs> true. I guess he'd still have to fight for a cab or a movie at this point. Yeah. But yeah, it's just sort of layered with, uh, you know, a lot of amazing performers. And of course, um, everybody knows that Steve Martin used to be good, but uh, was definitely good at this point. And of course, I mean, oh, we yeah. have to talk about John Candy, who was a legend and yes. uh, of course was taken from us too soon. But this is like one of his defining roles. He's so good in it. Like... There's so much com- like this is this is like one thing that I think is like you can't there's certain like jokes or like things that you actually can't just write for anyone or like can't have anyone do or it's like yeah. not even that funny when you think about it. But like I think of yeah. like when he is doing the whole like he's driving and Steve Martin's sleeping and he's like air playing along to that song. The Ray Charles song is yeah. like so funny like he is so funny the like (laughs) his little motions and all that stuff it's just like i think one of the funniest like physical comedy bits in in any movie (laughs) and a a good actor he can turn on a dime uh yeah and and show you things that you wouldn't expect you know when when they're in the uh when they finally have their the car blows up and they have their detente and uh and they're sharing the hotel room together and they're drinking the liquor bottles and you know, Neil's a little drunk and he's sort of talking about like family, you know, you've got your wife, you know, it's a, you never, oh. never, never let her go. And the look on John Candy's face is at first it's unreadable because you don't know what he's thinking. But then when you learn, you know, that his wife has passed away a while ago, you realize like the layers that right. are there. Yeah. Like, cause I'm watching it this time was watching it again. And um, I was sort of like looking out for that and they do, they do do a good job of like, having it there so they have all the stuff that they can like flash back to in case you don't get it but they're also yeah. good at like kind of keeping it concealed and that moment is like the key moment of like you can watch it the first time and it's like it it totally could pass under the radar but watching yeah. it again is like it's devastating and yeah he's yeah, it, so good <laughs> yeah and it's not like it's not really a twist so much but it is like it, you don't it, it, it's it's something I don't know. It's kind of like right in front of you, and I think it's sort of poignant in that you know Neil doesn't he just sees this guy as a monster and the literal devil at one point, and doesn't think about the fact that he's a human being. And there's this thing; it, it's, it's obvious he travels around all the time. He talks wistfully about this wife that he never calls. Like it's clear that she's dead, but you don't think about it because you know you're just not having empathy for other people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just sort of try to elevate this comedy movie maybe too high. The only thing that like throws me off about it is there's like one part where he's like, uh, you know, say hi to your wife for me. Like I f- and Steve Martin says, I feel like I know her, and I'm like, maybe that's just him saying it to be polite because like they really don't <laughs> talk about actually talk about her, and he ne- never seems interested in her. You yeah. know what I mean? In the same way yeah. that they actually talk about Steve Martin's wife. Yeah. Um. I. <laughs> yeah. I. Uh. I have a list of uh, my favorite, uh, like, like uh, insert, uh, you know, quick look jokes uh, <laughs> that tell you that the movie is, you know, this is this is an elevated reality. But uh, oh when yeah, when they're waiting at the gate but to get on the plane, and he sees Dell, and he's trying to, who do I know this guy? And then we just cut. <laughs> we just cut quickly to like a picture of him still in the, no. in the terminal, but with yeah, with a taxi cab window in front of him. And he goes, oh, like, oh that's it. <laughs> I or like the, that it just like flirts with that stuff, but it's not like totally out there. That tells me like right. there's actually like, like they actually had made a choice. You know what I mean? Yeah. To keep to, it to grounded, have... but wacky at times. Yeah, to be whimsical, but still, you know, have it be grounded emotionally. Um, I don't know if a car would still drive if all the parts inside right, of it melted. Ex- that, but... <laughs> right, or when their their fingers are, like, compressed into when the car. Their fingers are stuck into the dash. That's so yeah. good. Like when they're driving in the back of the pickup, you know, to the people train, and there's that mean dog, and then when they get get to their destination, they're all, like, comically frozen, and the dog's oh, also like, yeah. uh. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's a good bit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, boy, I, I mean, I could just go another 20 minutes just like listing all the great bits in the film. But um, is there anything that you want to say specifically about about the movie that we haven't um, said yet? You know, I think it, it <laughs> it's good. I like, you know, how I like the tone. I was sort of thinking at the end it it sort of crossed my mind and i know it's not really what they're trying to get across but at the very end it feels like yeah your wife said like i'm gonna come like rub it in your face like watch me make out with my wife or whatever (laughs) i know that's not what they're going for but like that did cross my mind i was like oh this poor guy (laughs) or there's there's a sequel where uh you know dell becomes the unwanted guest and then uh (laughs) You know, like 2000s Steve Martin would have made that movie. So, yeah, especially because they end it with just a shot on his face, like looking whimsically at them. It's yeah. like, oh, <laughs> um, you think I'm ever leaving? You're wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to know why it's 4250 for a motel room in 1987 in the middle of BFE nowhere. Yeah. That's a lot for it's, a motel room. It was in central Illinois. That's got to be. That's pretty they cheap. They did. I guess it did have a – so, I mean, they destroy that hotel room when they back into the wall, and also they clean up the mini bar. But then again, they paid with cash, and, and if you don't put your name down, you get away with it. But uh, that that was not exactly like uh, – yeah, just like a motor court room. 4250 seems like kind of high. I – you know, I will say just knowing the geography of everything helped with me with knowing the stakes – yeah. Um, and it was never in a way where I'm like, oh, well, actually, they should be. It, like, totally made sense. It was weird, though. Like, I feel like at one point they were, like, when the car blew up, they were, like, 108 miles from Chicago. And then, like, <laughs> the next. They had half tank of gas and uh, cigarettes. And... Then, like, yeah, the sorry, next but... day they were on that truck or whatever. And they were, like, oh, we're going to get there in three hours. And it's, like, well, 108 miles. like. Well, he's got to make deliveries, too. That's true. That's true. Fair enough. <laughs> there. Shut up. <laughs> I told you. Um, yeah, the, the the geography does it does work really well. And I'm trying to think, like, is it just how do you if you're going to do a Will Smith remake, how do you get rid of Uber? You know, how do you get rid of uh, Uber or Lyft? The, there will be. Yeah, they'll have to, like, write specific things where they lose their phone and. Because he goes to the cab stand and the guy's like, we're in St. Louis. I don't think anybody's going to drive you to Chicago, but you could absolutely find somebody on Uber to drive you, you know, probably cross country mm. if you paid them the whole way. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard of I've heard of people doing that. Um, yeah. Yeah. I just it's just, it's similar with like horror movies now where they have to like get rid of your phone. So you can't just like right. call yeah. someone or whatever. Like, yeah, I don't know. I, I could see I could actually think someone could like could pull that off. But. My question is more of like, why would you want to? And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I don't think anyone under like the way movies are currently made would do it very do you, well. Do you think, okay, so like, let's say this was made today or maybe like a couple of years ago with somebody like Steve Martin, a uh, director like John Hughes, do you think they could score the PG 13 with the, with All the, the f- fucking scene? Oh, no, definitely not. Can well, you even say it? Because it's not. It's non-sexual and it's all concentrated into, you know, sort of one one scene. And uh, I was thinking about this movie and it is rated R. I think that probably hurt it a lot when it came out because it didn't make a ton of money. So um, it doesn't have that tone otherwise. But nothing else in the movie is, yeah, is adult in any, in any way. So I was wondering it if wouldn't, like maybe... It wouldn't happen. Yeah. The MPA just says, you know, half the fucks. But, you know, because I've seen like... Uh, PG-13 movies that have like you can get away with more than one fuck sometimes you can okay I thought that was like a one time thing or something I think if Steven Spielberg like was like I need Lincoln to say fuck twice uh, he's gonna get his two fucks that'd be fair it would it wouldn't match like because that scene that's actually something I was gonna say is like that's another thing that's like relatable about it is like sometimes when this stuff even when it's not like comically wrong like sometimes like when you're traveling like that and like it does that anxiety is very real and you do want to like go ape shit uh i yeah. i i never like i had i had that recently um oh yeah but like i i i of course would never go ape shit on the random worker there but i i witnessed a lot of that you know and yeah. everyone's yeah. got that like rage inside of them you know and like yeah. that was like even though it was like 
so he was so hostile then um it was also very <laughs> relatable in a lot of ways yes yeah, you but don't it... want your movie to end in a mass shooting um, right oh my god now yeah so <laughs> i guess he must have paid cash like i it's a funny scene i don't mean to nitpick it but you know i am who i am <laughs> it but, was great uh, when she's like... just because he threw away his rental agreement like you know if he paid on with a credit card he can prove that he that he uh, rented the car. Yeah, that that was a little bit of a like heightened, it's a beside the point uh, heightened yeah. thing where she goes like you're fucked or oh, whatever. Like, no, <laughs> you're fucked. Yeah, but it was yeah that was like very satisfying and funny. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's what's great about the the pacing is more like if it's like him unraveling because then he gets punched out. Um, yeah, guy, okay. Never seen anybody picked up by their testicles before. And I I like that in place of the like. At second to third act like sad part it's actually like this that part is replaced by them just like hanging out drinking and like kind of bonding you know what i mean like that right right like that actually makes it feel more real to me is that or like yeah. i just more satisfying that it's like it unraveled him into like a m- more laid back guy <laughs> yeah yeah and that's why i think it's mm-hmm. like I think it's kind of supposed to be clear, or at least you're supposed to know something is wrong with Dell because, you know, it's three minutes to the end of the movie that we learn, like, the sort of final twist, if you want to call it that, and finally get all the information that we need about the character's, you know, emotionality. Uh, but it but it, it just it just fits. It just feels like it works. Like, you believe that Steve Martin would get off the northbound L, get on the southbound L, yeah. go back to the station. I don't think that like, station... Hey, what's going on? I don't think that station is an L station, but... Yeah. That's fine. <laughs> Maybe it is, but I don't think it is. That's what it says in the movie summary on Wikipedia. Nope. That's what I'm going off of. All right. Um, the only time I ever read rode the L, there was a puddle of piss in the uh, <laughs> indentation in the seat next to me. I still don't think that he was... Uh, they're on the blue line, I think, and that's not going to go to the direction that, that house no, is at can't get can't get can't get there from there i haven't seen that house but i did do over the summer i did a drive-by of the home alone house which oh, is yeah? like really close to that one yeah yeah they're all up in uh highland park or somewhere yeah up the there. north north of evanston and all that yeah yeah they're like there was um so I, identically I, fancy <laughs> yeah they're, they're all colonial style yeah mm-hmm. um I was reading a like a web page that was talking about all the locations, the houses that uh, Hughes used around Chicago, and like ninety percent of them are, are up north. But uh, I think uh, the Fugitive had like a condo like near downtown. Oh yeah, yeah. There is a there's some good Fugitive spots for sure. Oh yeah, <laughs> for sure. Well, uh, I think that we have covered this movie pretty well. So let's take a break for a word from our sponsors. We'll be back with more backtracking. I'm Mikan Hana. And I'm Caliban. I'm a huge Sailor Moon fan. I've been a Mooney since the beginning. I've seen every episode, every movie. I've read all the manga. I love it. I've got a head full of bad wiring and I've never seen a single episode. Do you want to join the wonderful world of Sailor Moon? Okay. Enter laughing. It's hard to believe that that was us. It feels like ancient history. We recorded that a few minutes ago. Ancient history, but but now that I'm a Sailor Moon expert. You're not an expert? But I'm trying. Every week on Sailor Noob, we talk about a new episode of the original Sailor Moon series. It's all new to me. And I'm a little more seasoned. I've been a Japanese language student and I've lived in Japan. And you use your experiences to talk about the food, fashion, and culture of every episode of Sailor Moon. What do you do again? Uh, share in the wonder of a classic anime series. Good <laughs> enough. Sailor Noob is a great companion for first-time watchers, and it is a fun hit of nostalgia for the experienced fan. You can catch the show every Friday, wherever you get your podcasts. And you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr, posting all things Sailor Moon. One day I shall be the master. Let's just get through this series first. Okay. Okay, we're back. It's time to talk about the Trek side of this equation. If Star Trek can be said to be truly about anything, it's that other people can make us better. Why else is diversity important? Why else do we seek peaceful coexistence with strangers? Why are we all part of one big happy fleet? The reason is that respecting other people gives us context and helps us develop the greatest technology of all, empathy. That's a lesson that two odd couples, 
Odo and Quark and Jake and Nog <laughs> learn the hard way in the DS9 episode, The Ascent. Two bitter rivals. I've been waiting ten years for you to get what you deserve. Must face a deadly confrontation. It's a bomb. Marooned on a barren world. We either freeze to death or starve to death. Two enemies. What do you hate? You have just one chance at survival. I'm dying! Each other on the next Star Trek Deep Space Nine. We got two storylines in this one, and I think they, they both um, kind of embody the planes, trains, and automobiles dynamic a little bit. In their own way, they absolutely do. Yes, which is why we are here to convince you that... And if if I needed to say anything else about this episode, uh, I would just say that this episode was released on November 25th, 1996, Thanksgiving week of that year. Coincidence? Do, 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 I do, think do, 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 do. No. It cannot be. Uh, the inspiration for this episode... Technically, I guess, uh, according to the writer of the episode, Iris Stephen Bear, is the absurdist play Waiting for Godot by Samuel Beckett. And in some ways, I can see that. You've got in this, uh, one half of this episode is two um, classic thespians, you know, two guys who have spent a lot of time on stage, Armin Shimmerman and René Aubergenois, doing literal bits from... Waiting for Godot. There's parts like when Quark loses his hearing. There's a part (laughs) in Waiting for for Godot that's like that. Uh, You know, he's like, hello, hello, hello. Um, But otherwise, they they do have an actual point, which is to get this thing up the mountain and to not die. And I don't think (laughs) it fits well with Waiting for Godot because the point of Waiting for Godot is like the futility of existence and and faith, and, you know, and these two guys are waiting for this guy that never shows up, and their their lives are never in danger. You know, I think that, um, I think I, yeah. I can see why they think that it, it, you know that's the inspiration. But you know, look at what we what we're doing here. You, you also add in there's the element of like it's kind of a road episode, you know. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're for in sure. the car together, and then they're climbing a mountain together. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> if only they had had like. Uh, it, you know, it's uh, shuttlecrafts, runabouts, and transporter beams, right. or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> if only there was like more more ways of transportation that would have completed it. <laughs> yeah, the threat. You know, the threat is real in this. Like they really are. Um, the Jake and Nog uh, part also kind of reflects um, the conflict between Dell and Griffith. Yeah. Probably more along a, like an odd couple kind of line. You know, where there's one's uh, fastidious, one's kind of a slob. Uh, one is taking it too far. The other one's like, yeah, whatever. I just want some orange juice. Mm-hmm. And uh, and the stakes, yeah, the stakes are higher for one than for the other. It's it's almost like you kind of like took elements of both characters and they like had like a transporter clone situation, huh. and then they both went on their own separate stories. You know what I mean? Because like they do, yeah. they embody the characters in kind of different ways. You know. Yeah, I think uh, um, the most. I feel like the mo- the thing that really sets the Odo Quark thing apart for me or like enhances it in a different way is that like is because they're like reoccurring characters that we have established and we know their dynamic. And yeah. so one thing they have in this that you don't really have in that movie is that like um, Odo and Quark, like, like they have the thing when they work together, they can get things done, which becomes kind of the point. But also there's this element of like, they're both each other's like weakness you know what yes. I mean? Like mm-hmm. they get mm-hmm. it. They get into like even worse situations because like they were like trying to get the other person. You know, like Odo by not revealing certain things. Like you know, yeah, Odo kind of fucks up in this a little bit. <laughs> yeah, and I guess that yeah. that does sort of happen in that movie a little bit. But it, I just thought it was more interesting in this because like it really works for their characters of like how they've been after each other so long that they're like they're like starting to like slip because they're so focused on uh you know getting the other guy yeah Dell is not a saint uh he you know is not just like a victim um there's the innocent mistake of their credit cards getting switched but then we find out later that Dell's kind of been holding on to that credit card and used it to to rent the car and everything and so yeah I mean he's not perfect in that instance something that's interesting about the the use of these two characters is that they are also here in the fifth season of the show, kind of the middle. They are both characters who are themselves are in flux. 
Um, right. Odo is uh, recently recently been made a solid, and so he's trying to deal with that. And then Quark has been you know liquidated and cleaned out by Brunt, and so he's basically you know been kicked out of the Ferengi uh, you know commerce world and their religion. So he they're both characters who are in a state of transition, um, and so we right. throw them both together and, and and see what happens. And you see, um, with with like the way that they like are kind of fixated on the other is like, you see, you actually see like, you see stuff like Odo taking uh joy in like annoying quark in a way. Like you don't really <laughs> see Odo take joy at yes. all. Otherwise, yeah. you know, at least he's like more private about the things he likes. Whereas like yeah. this, just like, you know, when he makes the little like lip smacking noise and he like chuckles to himself <laughs> and I'm like, you never actually really see him laugh otherwise, you know? Yeah. Maybe he's starting to feel a little more human and he's enjoying uh, you know, the, <laughs> the sort of humanity a little more. Although uh, Quark has a great point, though, uh, when he confronts him and he says, like, this whole time, you know, you've been a solid and you've wanted to eat and sleep and fuck and do all these things. And now you can do all those things. It turns out you're just an asshole. <laughs> you would have been like this no matter what. You're just doing the same thing. Yeah. You're just a dick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's like a funny thing about Odo. He's, he, he's always like, I've never understood the solids need to do this. And it's like, yeah, okay, that doesn't really seem like something that has to do with you being a changeling. But okay, man, <laughs> whatever you say. Yeah, Odo's an interesting character. And I would love to see... Um, somebody try to do a character like this again, like in a, in a more modern context, you know, because he, he could be a metaphor for so many sort of intersectionalities as far as like, you know, being genderless or being gender fluid or, or what have you. Um, I see a lot of my um, autistic friends kind of see him as like a, you know, a, a spectrum uh, type character. Mm. And I think that they were just like, you know, sometimes a cigar is just a Odo turned into a cigar. And I think they were just kind of playing him straight, mostly as as the writers went. There was that one episode where um, he meets another male changeling. And I think they were actually trying to do like a story about like a gay couple or a gay relationship. But if they tried to do that now, hopefully they'd be able to layer that with more um, with more metaphor and allegory, um, which is what we want from our Star Trek. Yeah. Or dick jokes. We like those two. <laughs> It'd be interesting to see because, like, one thing that's, like, he's always kind of walking the line of, too, is, like, that he he's, like, a cop, but he's also, he also was, like, a cop for, like, the occupying, like, people that, like, they've kind of drawn, like, allusions to, like, the Nazis. <laughs> you know what I yes. mean? And that's, yes. that's a very – sometimes I feel like they approach that really well. And then other times it's, like, they just will have, like, a throwaway line about, like, yeah, like uh, the Bajorans actually like really like you because of this, and it's like that seems kind of weak, you know. Like, uh, it, let's, yeah, let's examine I, that more, you know. Yeah, it, it's funny that on a show that's literally about people who are in the military, like he is the one who gets all of the. He's had he's had to be several different kinds of cops over the course of the show, and they explore copiness through Odo. Um, in different ways. So yeah, he's like a former collaborator, basically. And we kind of run with some stories with that. He's also like the marshal where, yes, he follows the law, but he also care. He cares more about justice than the law. So sometimes he'll look the other way or, you know, or, or break the law because he feels like it's the law is not just. Uh, and then other times he's just kind of, you know, the guy who's just peeking into quarks and trying to see yeah. if he's <laughs> illegally surveilling quark <laughs> yeah, being a chair yeah, is or a painting or something like that. that. Yeah. There is, yeah, I, I feel like an Odo show could have been cool because there are like good episodes where he is just like investigating something and it's like, oh, like that would actually be fun to watch more often, but you could also get into like his past. I mean, they do that on this show, but yeah. uh, sometimes I see that I'm like, oh, they, this could have been like a whole thing. <laughs> he'd still do that you know he, he can take any form uh, you have to explain why he doesn't want to look like Rene Bergerois anymore but you could yeah totally bring Odo that back. might be crass I feel like oh there's a lot of things that are crass that they have done nonetheless that's true but... that's true <laughs> yeah um I, I just like I you know I'm waiting for the Kirk casting basically mm, that, okay they're gonna replace isn't him it, yeah isn't a young hot Kirk gonna show up on Strange New Worlds don't you think 
yeah like see well you know like i could see that like in a good show like getting away with it like a f- like many seasons in but i feel like that's something they'll wait they'll till be shatner's like, they'll wait till shatner's oh, gone okay it'd be like a tribute to him <laughs> yeah then, and then they'll say because he would have hated it but then they'll say oh this is in order to pay tribute to him yes we're gonna bring this character back yeah yeah you're right that'll probably that's inevitable i think that's totally gonna happen <laughs> Um, yeah, they, so they have a, uh, pretty, um, you know, difficult job here is that they have to, they have nothing. This explosion has somehow destroyed very specifically coats and food and things that they need to survive. And so they got to get this thing all the way up the mountain. And it made me think of like other, um, movies where this happens or situations, you know, like uh, the defiant ones or something like that, where you've got two people who are, um, ha- have to like escape and survive and learn to trust each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and they actually do, because that's something like in the movie, uh, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, you you don't totally get the sense that it's like they can get through it all through cooperation, you know? Like, in fact, like Steve Martin even has that line. I know he's trying to get rid of him, but he's like, you know, when we work together, we really don't get anywhere. We don't do it, yeah. And I think <laughs> yeah. that's actually true. Like, I think that it's kind of pure chance that they ever get out of any situation or it's it's yeah. maybe more like you know maybe just their like philosophies will get them somewhere like the go with the flowness of dell or whatever but in in the in the episode you do kind of have the sense of like cork actually is bringing something to the table that's propelling them forward as with odo you know like there's things that they both know and they actually kind of work together to accomplish something, you know? Yeah, the only thing that is their fault that puts them in the situation is, um, you know, their pasts. So Quark's, we don't know what he did with the Orion Syndicate, but we know that they want him dead. And then Odo also underestimated the, the you know, the size of the of the, of the convict here or, or the problem. Um, so that puts them in a situation where they're not on the Defiant. They don't have more people with them. They're not really prepared for it. But otherwise, it's just circumstance. Like, there isn't anything that they do wrong to to end up, you know, where they are. Right. Whereas, I I don't think it really... You, you kind of wonder if, like, if Neil or and Dell, maybe just Neil, had just stayed put and got, like, the red eye, would any of this have happened? You know, is it is it they're trying to do shortcuts, what gets them in trouble? Or is this Herculean effort what was needed to get from New York to Chicago by way of Wichita in like a really bad snowstorm on Thanksgiving uh, uh, week? Yeah, that's... I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure. Yeah, but I, I, d- I wouldn't want that totally to be answered, but uh, I feel like it yeah, does... And like, it, it, yeah, it's cool that it's not answered, yeah. It kind of would have been better, like, um, in the movie, Steve Martin... Uh, Neil has this moment where he's like, well, they said there's a good chance I can get on standby. And I actually had that happen to me recently. And I, I actually did have sort of this nagging feeling of like, uh, maybe I should just not do that and do this instead. Uh, huh. You know, and I, I was seeing like a huge line form of people who were like not going on standby. They didn't want to do it. So I was like, okay. I'm just going to stay put. And that was actually the solution. I was like, I'm just going to wait because there's an, I have no other control. I will go with the flow. Um, and but it, it was it was like up until the last moment till like after the flight was even supposed to go off, uh, take off that, you know, I got on like hours after because it kept getting delayed. Okay. Anyway, yeah. in the movie, they kind of settle that question when they have uh ben stein come on and say like the flight's canceled you know oh, there's like, no flight yeah. It, yeah it almost i feel like would have been maybe interesting it's kind of a minor detail but if he was like yeah i, I mean i don't want to take my chances you know and kind of puts himself yeah, he in sort the situation. yeah he, he he makes a, a a deal with this devil you know he he could just wait for the next flight or or stay there overnight but dell makes a tempting offer and so he you know, accepts this, uh, you know, he tries to get out of line, basically. Um, and the movie doesn't do that. And I think it would still work if it did. But it's interesting that they are presented as kind of victims of their circumstance, and then maybe a little negligent. 
not not keeping their rental agreements, uh, smoking in the car. Oh, definitely. Uh, you know. Yeah, there are other <laughs> yeah, ways sort of in way that it's like they clearly like kind of made the bed they're laying in or whatever. You know. <laughs> yeah, together with each other. <laughs> yeah, covered in beer. <laughs> Uh, let's flip over to the Jake and Nog side of this episode. And everybody, you know, it's called The Ascent, and everybody thinks of it as that time that Renee and Armin got to, you know, hang around on, uh, you know, wherever they were, the Cascade Mountains. Um, I, you forget that it's a Jake and Nog episode. Yeah. And, it's, and I actually, I kind of like the Jake and Nog part of it better. Yeah, yeah. I, I like it because it's like... Um... A change in their dynamic, from whereas like the Cork and Odo, it's kind of like them classically doing what they do best <laughs> with each other, right? Whereas right. It, it kind of moved their characters forward in a different way, you know. Yeah, and and of course, Nog is you know one of the success stories of DS Nine, just seeing that character go from essentially a, a street urchin to uh, to being a a cadet and uh, and being in Starfleet and. Um, and just being more responsible. And I like the idea of the Ferengi who's like, all right, we're getting up at 430. We're going to pump some iron. Get some you know, muscles. Yeah. Do some drills. And we're gonna, then we're going to clean this place top to bottom. And then as just being like a creative person myself, like <laughs> I did really a lot of those uh, digs at Jake hit home for me. Uh, yeah, like for he, sure. When he comes home and Jake's like playing uh, like a Dom Jot on his phone. And he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, hey. Don't criticize a writer's process, okay? Sometimes we need, I need to watch three hours of YouTube videos. That's how this works. It's it's sometimes, because I definitely related to that, that a little bit, but it's, it is sometimes, like, corny about it, but not wrong. Like, like Jake has that line of, like, don't change a writer's words without asking. That's sacrilege. I, like, kind of yeah. rolled my eyes. Not that, Actually, that's editing, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's not, like, wrong. Like, it is very rude to change it without asking but i don't know like right, sacrilege yeah. like calm down <laughs> yeah yeah he's he's, he's getting a, he's all a young, he's about a teen it. you know i get it yeah yeah and it all culminates in they kind of let that drop because they just sort of get together in the end and of course they're friends so they it get all works parent out, trap but yeah right because the parents get together i love that reverse scene too, parent where, trap where uh cisco and uh and rob sit down and they're like oh boy my kid's doing this yeah my kid's doing this and he's he's so neat and clean i th- I thought he might even been a changeling so i took some of his blood oh, oh my Whoa! god <laughs> wait a minute what's going on wow get serious <laughs> yeah it plays into the paranoia um yeah, yeah. well that, yeah that's what's going on in the background that's great there's a reverse parent trap the parents yeah. yeah i like um it's a thing where it's like it's a minor they minorly show off like what Cisco's all about where he's like I'm your dad and I'm your captain and so you have to do what I say and it's it it always just shows off how like Cisco is kind of like willing to like inappropriately flex his authority even if he's being a little <laughs> like cheeky about it you know he's like I'm your captain so you have to get along with my son you know <laughs> right yeah <laughs> I mean, it is um, because he makes the excuse that there's like no other room, which is like, I mean, you're the commander of the station. I'm sure you could pull some strings, but he's like, no, this is the the, now the now the law and authority are going to help me solve this. And so that's such a dad. I'm your boss. Yeah. So I'm just going to apply that power uh, where it needs to be applied. I feel like, too, it's a very I think Deep Deep Space Nine uh, other shows do, too. But I, I like how they are willing to show like this starfleet cadet like kind of have him represent like being a complete dork you know what i mean because like so much so much of the time we watch when people watch and think about star trek they're like starfleet is kind of like this aspirational thing you know and and maybe it's overcorrecting because he's like a frangi and he has this dream and he doesn't want to be like his father or whatever but i also do feel like it's a little bit of the show being like yeah, like the Starfleet values are good and all, but like you also become like kind of a little dork, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. Or like, you know, and, like Picard <laughs> is cool and all, but it's like he does love the rules a lot. <laughs> yeah. And that's that's something that um I uh I you know, we're currently in the process of kind of reorganizing um what I want to deliver with uh with my other show, Enterprising Individuals, but something I definitely want to focus on and and talk about 
uh, next season is the fact that I think that, yes, we all love the diversity in Star Trek, but maybe watching a show about a bunch of people who all are in the military and follow orders and love authority for 50 years has ill prepared us for like our current political climate. You know, I think that Star Trek needs to, if it wants to stay relevant and wants to stay uh, keep its moral authority it needs to at least have one of its million shows be something that's about that that actively explores how uh starfleet you know can be a, a bad force a he- hegemonizing yeah uh, they've tried fascist kind of force and i maybe that attacks that too closely to the heart you know to the root of like what we like about star trek but i'd, I'd like to see that happen because even in Picard, where they're all renegades and stuff like that, like the one, the captain of their ship is like an ex-Starfleet guy. And his whole arc is like trusting Picard, who was this great commander that he looked up to. It's just him coming mm-hmm. back into the fold. I even, like, I feel like they've, like, they've, like, approached it and done pretty well in, like, Deep Space Nine and stuff. But I think of, like, that one episode where uh, where they're on Earth and, like, they're testing everyone where yeah. where it's like the guy it's still like well he was good intentioned you know what i mean <laughs> yeah like cisco's dad like they you know give us your blood and then it's like this big thing that they're trying to get the blood of like a starfleet captain's dad and then the next scene he's like oh, i know they meant well yeah like, no be be angry about that the whole villain yeah yeah and i think that's something like they tried in like like i think a season one of discovery where it's like oh, what pushed us to this war and blah, blah, blah. But then, like, they end with just, like, this big speech of, like, and we're Starfleet and, like, our values matter. And it's like, yeah, this would cause me to, like, reexamine our whole structure, you know, but I don't know. Yeah, there's a um, there's another Star Trek podcast that I like uh, called Antimatter Pod. And on it, they talk about uh, all Star Trek, but they were talking about the first season of Discovery and some people's criticisms of uh, Michael Burnham and how maybe maybe the criticism are a little little suspicious. You know, people talk about like she shouldn't be a captain; she's a mutineer and she's like a terrible person. And there, I mostly agree with them. I haven't really thought thought it all the way through, but their argument was: look at the system that she is a part of and what's going on. And when she has her trial for being a mutineer or whatever it's like a shadowy room with like people whose faces that we don't see it's yeah. coded to be this thing you know every time you see a shadowy room with faceless people Man. like that is not an institution that uh that you should look Any up to section 31? i would argue that <laughs> you know yeah well there you go yeah i would argue that the show and the franchise does not continue to follow up on that but i think it well, is a good point that's why it's weird make. when they go a thousand years in the future and it's like Anyway, everything Star is Fleet exactly values. the goddamn same. We ha- yeah, it's all the, it's all the fucking same. Yeah. And then she's going to the, the first we don't I mean, I haven't seen the show yet. You can uh, join us on Thursday nights where we talk live about new episodes of Discovery and Prodigy on Discovery. There's my plug. Uh, the first uh, the first title of the first episode of the fourth season of Discovery is Kobayashi Maru. They're still doing the fucking Kobayashi Maru in the 32nd century? Like this abusive test that tells you nothing about a person? Oh my god. I didn't know that. That's rough. Yeah. This isn't specifically Discovery. Though. You know, like I said, Deep Space Nine. Hey, we're hating Nine. on Discovery, just like, just like you like. <laughs> no, Deep <laughs> Space Nine, you. you know, I, well, they yeah. also do the commentary sometimes really well, you know, but... Yeah, I don't know. It always it always does stop short of like questioning the entire structure. You know, they would never really do that. You know, Deep Space Nine does it the best. And one of the things that I like about Deep, one of the things I here we'll start with something I don't like. I don't like that <laughs> Deep Space Nine is a little too goofy for me sometimes. Like, no, I, you hold don't on. you don't want it to be all dark. But they are in the middle of like an intergalactic war, and the first scene in this episode is like. Come on, Jake. You're not gonna move out, are you? Ah, oh. <laughs> like it's like this weird stagey. I kind love of, it. Like, no, I, scene. I don't accept this criticism. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, anyway, I like one of the like, things. I... <laughs> let's play baseball. Let's. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, right. One of the things I like about DS9 is that it can do anything. Like a TNG story is basically a TNG story. They're gonna run up against a planet where the people are on drugs or something. It's some kind of metaphor. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're going to have a solution that not everybody's happy with and Captain Picard's going to look sad. Or if they try to do something else, it's a flop. It's a Worf's a Cowboy episode. <laughs> it's uh, something like that. But DS9 can do all of those things. I just think it's kind of corny sometimes. 
It is sometimes, but I, I don't know. There's something, and I, I think I've sort of come around on Voyager to this too. And I, I think sometimes yeah. they do it better where like, I don't know when it is corny. It just makes me think like, this is Star Trek. You know, I mean, this feels like, <laughs> yeah. this just makes me think of Kirk fighting some weird goofy alien. You know what I mean? I, I, I like when it's corny. Um, yeah. I, I like cornball stuff, but you know, sometimes that it's just corny and you can't deal with it, but I don't know. It's, it's yeah. a and fine I, line for sure. Oh, it is. And I don't want to be the guy who's like, I only like in the pale moonlight. Only oh, the serious. Cisco's deep, so yeah, cool. I get that. I'm not like that either. I'm just saying like, as, mm-hmm. um, as somebody who, uh, who's a performer himself, um, I appreciate the naturalistic acting of, uh, Patrick Stewart a little more than the kind of presentational, um, stagey acting of an Avery Brooks, who has delivered some of the top all time like performance oh. in Star Trek scenes, uh, but is you know you know he's like well everybody we're doing this it's like okay <laughs> <laughs> he does go nuts I do like I do like I feel like it holds those tones so much better than any of the other shows like and especially because sometimes you don't know where it's coming from like. Uh, I recently watched like there's like that two parter, um, it, like by Inferno's light is one of the episodes that yeah. was like the end mm-hmm. of it, and then like they followed up with Bashir's gonna get the the hologram doctor, and you're like oh now it's like goofy, but then that episode turns like way more serious than you could ever imagine. Yeah, and so that's what I like about the show is that it's like constantly holding like both goofy and like extremely serious uh like opposite ends of the spectrum that i feel like like other shows the other ones like don't approach that level of like disparity at the same time you know yeah i think that um and i could be wrong i'm not saying it applies to everything but like when voyager is going to do a serious episode it's like all right this is set the mood to serious uh, and if they're going to do a fun one, it, it's fun. But yeah, DS9 can do those swings. Um, yeah, the episode that you pointed out is like, it starts with, wouldn't it be fun if there was a holographic Bashir to like, oh my God, Bashir's dad is going to jail. <laughs> like, that's what happens at the end of that episode. <laughs> and like everything we've thought about him has been like a kind of a fabrication or whatever, you know? Yeah. Uh, too bad it came in like the fifth season. It's kind of late to actually have like uh, some development for that character. Yeah, that's true. I well, he's he, they get they let him go on some missions though, so that'd be that's fun. Yeah, I, I guess. I feel like it's after a season of them being like, I just don't know what, what to do with him because I feel like they gave up pretty early on like their his original character arc because it was like, <laughs> which is just creeping on Dax. Yeah, they were like, mm. even then, I feel like it's weird for those guys knowing who makes this show to be like this isn't really working you know that seems like something they would have stuck with till the end but i feel like they drop it pretty quick and then they don't know what what to do said i'm just i'm hearing chakotay that's all i'm hearing oh yeah that's fair (laughs) yeah uh chakotay is is that in spades it's like look kill this character or like do something else with him because it's just the same stuff over and over and now they're bringing him back in star trek prodigy they are oh Yes, I think he's going to be on this week because the title of the episode this week is Dreamcatcher. Is he going to be like a hologram too? Or I see we don't know, uh. Uh, but you can find out by watching Prodigy and then we talk All right, about I'm, it. I'm uh, going to watch on it. Thursday. Yeah. Uh, should we move on to yeah, our technological yeah. exchange? Good episode. Uh, technology, <laughs> technology is, uh, yeah, good episode. Uh, technology is at the heart of everything we talked about today, especially with the trains and the planes and the things and the automobiles. And sometimes uh, it facilitates what the characters are doing. Sometimes it's the actual complication that they're dealing with. So on every show, we randomly pick from a list of Star Trek technologies. We add what we get to the non-Trek media and subtract it from the Trek episode to see how each would be different. We call this our technological exchange. And here is the list of technologies that we have. Uh, we've got phasers, holodecks, tricorders, transporters, warp drives, replicators, communicators, shields, advanced medical technology, and androids. And if we roll on our random number selecting device, we get five. <laughs> of course we do. Warp drive. Oh, uh, if you added warp drive, <laughs> planes, trains, and uh, warp capable uh, aircraft. Warp trains? Oh my <laughs> god, we got the warp trains. 
Yeah, I was sort of so one. The movie, the movie ends in the middle of the second act when the warp train uh, explodes <laughs> and takes out all of Kansas. Yeah, like if they're, yeah, I was thinking warp or like transporters would kind of break this. But at the same time, who's to say something wrong, couldn't go wrong with those, you know? That's true. I think the first thing that this, uh, the, the, the easiest way to go with this is it's in space, right? So you just do an episode of Star Trek that is directly, explicitly, you know, inspired by planes, trains, and automobiles. You call it, you know, uh, shuttlecraft, runabouts, and transporter beams. And then you've got a character, you know, trying to get from DS9 to Earth or something for Life Day or whatever it is. Uh, and then you just have them go on like this wild ride of planets and aliens trying to get where they're going. I think, yeah, I think even though we've definitively proved that this is a better episode or a better movie to go with than Waiting for Godot, I still think yes. there's a fertile ground in doing it again, but having more of the road movie element. I think that uh-huh. could be fun, like a Star Trek road trip. I'm trying. So there's only 800 something episodes. I'm trying to think if there's something like that. I can't. You know think what? Of you know what I think no. of what? There's. Is it Redemption, uh, where Picard and Data uh, have to hitch a ride on a bird of prey to get to yeah. uh, Romulus? And uh, there's a little bit of like travel comedy with like, oh, I'll sleep on the bed. Oh, I'll go over there. Yeah, that's still. That's only a scene, you know. Yeah, that's true. And then they're just kind of there doing the thing. What, there's um, there's that one episode of DS9 that's uh, where <laughs> where uh, Jeffrey Combs plays both Brunt and uh, yeah and Wayun. Of that, it's a sort of comedy of errors where Jake and Nog are sort of bouncing between all these groups trying to trade their stem bolts for for a baseball card or whatever. But that's not really traveling yeah. somewhere. The, it really, I think, Deep Space Nine really was the show to do it. Because I think you said way back in our Wonder Woman episode that it feels like the show best situated to do comedy. I think that's yeah. why it can carry all those tones at once is because... Boy, I said that a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, the beginning of the year, basically. Still so right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think that... Um, I think that, like... So, so remember the episode Explorers? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That is that is a road episode yeah that's specifically about travel i think it's more of a it's more of a like a like a you know disaster movie kind of like uh like robert redford's on a boat you know and then the sail is broken and he's got to survive but they are traveling in that there's like a b plot too that kind of takes away from it right i think there um, is yeah that's the one where like i think bashir and o'brien um have a lot of scenes that kind of like they cement their friendship in that hmm. yeah who would I guess it would have been perfect for a uh, Bashir O'Brien pre you know them becoming friends like that would have been a good they kind of do go on like they go on that one trip the storyteller planet or whatever oh my god I feel oh like that's god. when they like first start to have an appreciation do, we don't do enough DS nine on this show <laughs> There's, I'm just seeing all these like amazing things that we could do that's one uh, the one that I think really cements O'Brien or at least begins oh. like their friendship is the one where they go to he gets a help disease this race or something, out right well they go to help this race out because uh, they're getting rid of all their like nuclear weapons but they're like um metagenic weapons or something and they try to kill them because they want to keep the weapons and they're going to be like oh we don't know what happened to those guys so o'brien and uh, bashir end up like hiding in like a you know like a burned out city on, on, yes. on their planet and he tells them yeah. about like keiko or whatever and they kind of bond yeah. or whatever yeah. yeah yeah that's that would be perfect well we have, we have to put that down on the list but that doesn't get us to warp trains. Oh shoot! Yeah, I guess we didn't really. Yeah, no, we did answer it. It would just be, it would oh, just be okay. Deep Space Nine. <laughs> yeah, I guess it would. Yeah. Uh, what if what if you added a spore drive to planes, trains, and automobiles? Oh, spore drives, warp trains, and transporter beams. That <laughs> <laughs> I think we got it. Uh, I know what I'm working on. Photoshop tonight. Uh, let's move on to the uh, Star Trek episode and take Warp Drive out of the Ascent, a show that is essentially two sets of characters in stationary locations, but uh, does need Warp Drive to make its original premise. Well, work. they are they're warping. 
right? I mean, the yeah, sh- they are warping because they're going to somewhere. Not the Inferno or- Prime. Inferno Prime, and you can't just you could never get there with that warp drive. No, and apparently it's it's going to take them eight days at uh, presumably cruising speed. So that's it's a ways away. That seems like a long enough trip that like it should have never just been the two of them. Yeah, <laughs> like no, that long of a trip. I feel like like there's got to be like Starfleet protocol for like okay, like this long length of a trip needs this approval and this sort of crew. You know, like I don't know. Yeah. I'm sure there is. They never get into the logistics of like public transportation and um, shipping and <laughs> all that sort of stuff in Star Trek, which <laughs> I know it sounds boring, but like when Bashir's parents come to visit him, they just got on like a, a space plane, right? They don't have a ship. So yeah. you'd have to. You know, there is. So here's the deal. There is there is a world inside Star Trek that you could do planes and trains and automobiles. They've just never really bothered to show us if Dell would work for the military and he could just call down, you know, a shuttlecraft or requisition, you know, a, a ship or something like that. Um, there would be no movie. Yeah. But I feel like it would come with its own like modern problems, you know, like, yeah, like you probably have to have like credits or something. You know what I mean? Like they probably have like an allowance that you're allowed to use or something if they have, you know, I, I think about like, oh, they talk about, you know, um, Cisco having like uh, using all his transporter credits to go home to visit his dad or whatever when he was in college. Or I think they say that like, yeah, I think that's like a concept where it's like you have. Your, oh, I thought your, there wasn't any money in the future. Well, they have like they have like their dole. They're allowed, you know. Right. That sounds like money. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you can never uh, not have any money. That's uh, well, it's, my, it cannot, my, my economist friend uh, told me that. Right. Well, it's yeah, but it's more like uh, yeah, your 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 UBI or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sure. Uh, oh man, I want to talk about that instead. We got to keep doing this. Uh, so if we can't change the essential premise, they have to be able to get to the planet still. But uh, but warp drive doesn't exist. Mm. So so they're on this planet. Um, I guess that would really complicate. Uh, their rescue because they get this. No one's it, getting it, to it, them. It, it, yeah, it's not enough to just set up this uh, this beacon. Like they still have to uh, be rescued. Um, I, I thought it was it's fine to do, but I think they kind of played with the with the timing a little because it has to be tense. We have to see you know Quark trying to get up the mountain, and then Odo is like making his final log. And I don't. I think those two scenes are days apart, possibly. You know, because mm-hmm. Odo is like rescued in the middle of making his his last will <laughs> yeah. and testament so clearly quark didn't just turn the thing on yeah i mean it works i, I don't know i was i was sort of like yeah we're at the end yeah it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't yeah it doesn't bother me too much the only thing is is like you're also kind of tracking you're using the jake and, and nog plot to sort of track like day by day you know what's happening that's kind of the yardstick for how long they've been on the planet since they take place in essentially the same amount of time i like they kind of resolve that before the like, getting to the real life and death situation. Right. There was yeah, no, no cutting back to arguing over dirty socks. Yeah. There was like some other episode I was watching of deep space nine the other night. And it was like the same thing where, uh, there was like something really intense and serious going on, <laughs> but then there was yeah. like a stupid B plot. And like, they cl- like, it was clearly like a weird balancing act where it's like, okay, we got to kind of wrap up the one thing, but yeah. you don't want it to take away from like someone might die here in this yeah. other thing. One of my favorite sci-fi shows, Farscape, uh, had a, a sequence where um, at the end of this one episode, um, one of the main characters like dies, and it's very tragic. And this character is just gone. That's it. They're not coming back. And then the next episode. They did. <laughs> they, they did a thing where one of the characters gets bonked on the head and sees like everything is like Chuck Jones, uh, Looney oh Tunes God. animation, and they do this whole like Roadrunner, like Wiley Coyote thing, and it's like that's not a good follow up for what just happened. That is insane. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay. Well, it just couldn't happen. <laughs> there's just, well, there's just no way they, you wouldn't have a space station. You wouldn't have Cork anything. doesn't meet the Orion syndicate. I don't know. Um, 
I think that like something that gets glossed over is the the travel time. You know, warp drive allows you to go to the stars, but the stars are very far apart. So you've just created a situation kind of like what we have or had in our frontier times. You know, Star Trek is, you know, pitched as wagon train to space. And so um, going somewhere physically would take you a long ass time and would require a big ship. So I think you would get something like what you get back in the old days, there'd be a lot of correspondence. There'd be a lot of like mm. letters and transmissions and, you know, uh, subspace telegrams and things like that. I think you would, you would have to do things from a distance. It's cool that Nog is like coming back home after being at the Academy, but maybe he would just be talking to, you know, his dad on Skype or something like mm-hmm. that instead of physically going out there. I think they do a good job of like on all the shows of like kind of selling you on, like the the great distances they still have to go despite like l- like of having it feel like that sort of frontier like you know when it's like oh we have to get a send a subspace message to starfleet that we could take 24 hours to hear back you know like I, yeah they still do when sell you on like ah it's far when it's dramatically convenient but mm-hmm. in, in like a star trek movie distances mean nothing like everybody just gets wherever they are that's true like the one the one time i can think that they even bothered was uh, Star Trek Six, where uh, Sulu is, you know, out by Kronos, and then he has to come back t- and uh, save Captain Kirk. And so, for the last like act of the film, like the Excelsior is just flying at top speed, and we just kind of cut back to him every once in a while. That's true, yeah. But like, even in this, Fly you know, apart, then. eight days to get wherever they're going is still like that's a long, you know, long time. Yeah, it's always a little fuzzy about, I'm sure you could look it up on an internet map, but it's it's fuzzy about how far away Deep Space mm-hmm. Nine is from Earth. It's called Deep Space Nine. Uh, so I that's assume nine that it's deep supposed spaces to be far. away. Yeah, that, that, that's, uh, God forbid it was Deep Space Ten. Well, but, I'm uh, thinking like now, if you were like summoned for like jury duty anywhere on the planet. <laughs> Cisco, you got to change your address to Deep Space Nine. Now you have to go to jury duty back on Earth. I'm thinking like <laughs> there's nowhere today where you couldn't get it. Like it wouldn't take you eight days to get anywhere. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like the well, world it's... they're living in, you know, I don't yeah. know. It feels way, way more expansive. Yeah. I'm not sh- unless it's a planes, trains and automobiles situation. That's true. Well, if you fly to like Wichita, that's that's the wrong way. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. It would be cool to see just like a planes, trains and automobiles like in Star Trek, but where it, yeah, it's not like life or death and it is just like two guys being completely inconvenienced and and that's it, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's why I thought of that uh the Jake and Nog episode because it's it, like they it's end so up fine. Yeah. They they get beamed onto like way you. They're literally talking to like one of the guys who is the enemy, and but it's all about like a baseball card. <laughs> That'd be great in this if it's like to settle their differences. They uh they send them to a J- Jemadar uh, internment <laughs> camp, and they have to fight right. it out. <laughs> yeah, pit pit fight it out. Yes, that's what I want to see. <laughs> Well, I think that we, uh, I think we completely convinced everyone. No one could even argue with us now that clearly uh, this episode was in part no, just inspired. Watch by the two things. And yeah, just watch them with your <laughs> You'll eyes. You'll see. Should we tell people what's coming up in the next episode of Backtracking? Yes. Well, we're going back to Enterprise so soon, which is cool. I'm always happy to go back to Enterprise. We're watching the episode Exile, which I don't, re- I don't remember what it is. So I'm excited to see that but uh, apparently it's going to fit right alongside with uh la belle et la bette which is the yes. beauty and the beast uh yes the old the old uh, french film right yeah it's yeah a cocteau um never it's, seen it. uh it, it's the, the the enterprise episode could well we'll talk about it on the show but it could arguably be uh sort of paired up or compared to several different things but since we're doing kind of a movie focus this year um it's definitely uh connected to Beauty and the Beast and we have a chance to watch one of the classic films of the early uh French era yeah i'm excited it's going to be like it, it's cool cuz it's going to be both like very familiar to story I know, obviously, yeah. but also like, yeah, uh, an experience I've probably, you know, only seen 
clips and you know i know all uh, like about it but yeah yeah i'm excited it's a weird movie it's but it's cool though well, that's it for this week's Backtrekking. Thanks for listening, everyone. If you like the show, tell a friend, and you can follow us at, at Backtrekking on Twitter. And also tell us, when you follow us, what you think we should talk about in future episodes. Gooey, tell the people where they can find you online. Uh, you can find me. I'm on Twitter at Gooey Fame. And I'm at, at K-A-1-I-B-A-N on Twitter. You can find all the shows on the Just Enough Trope Network at, at Just Enough Trope on Twitter. That's it for us for this week. We'll see you soon. And until then, keep on trekking. Trekking.